What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 576 of the Talking Bears podcast and YouTube show. Ben Fan with you here. It is March 21st, 2024. Hopefully, everybody is doing well. The Padres, they are one and one headed back here to San Diego. They're probably going to be landing in San Diego on, no, actually tonight, later tonight, I believe, is when they should because just of the different, the time change. Uh, it's going to be a long flight. It is a long flight that they're doing right now. It seems like they were gassed. Their legs were tired, but the adrenaline kind of took over in this second game. They were going so many spots. So much attention was being, you know, that being pulled in so many different directions. And so I think, you know, Manny is not the only person that is glad. Tati, same thing, that is glad that this trip is over and that they are coming back home. Uh, now, Sure, they get a day off on Friday, but Saturday, Sunday, they still are going to be at the Peter Sather Memorial Fan Fest and then Monday, Tuesday, exhibition games. And so their next day off after tomorrow isn't until Wednesday and tomorrow or yeah, yeah, Wednesday, because Thursday's the home opener. Tomorrow, though, like their clock's going to be all off. They're probably just going to want to sleep in their bed the entire day. Um, so I don't know how like productive they're they're going to be on their first days back. But for what most people care about, obviously, Padres, Dodgers talking about these games. Obviously, I hit on yesterday's game in yesterday's episode when the Padres lost to the Dodgers and how that was crushing and they lost multiple leads. And this one was way more, um, I think, way more entertaining because of like the the amount of runs that were being scored and the Padres were scoring. The Dodgers were coming right back. And then the Padres would go score again, and it was just back and forth, back and forth. And thankfully, the Padres won this game. I'm a fan of a well-pitched game, but you had a little bit of both as well um, in this series. And so it was. It reminded me a little bit of 2023, like I said in my initial post-game reaction this morning, where one day it's underwhelming offense, then the next day they look like the best offense of all time. And Jake Cronenworth, goes four for four and Tatis scores a couple runs. Bogart scores a couple runs. Manny scores a couple runs, a huge home run that he hit. Um, I mean, Camposano scored a couple runs. He got three hits. Tyler Wade got a couple of hits, like everyone coming through. Jackson Merrill almost hits a home run. So it's just totally different. And sure, Xander, I thought Xander had a really good series offensively, not just yet, uh, today's game, but yesterday's game as well. But it's still that inconsistency. The main takeaways from this series, I'm going to get into like this game individually here in a minute. But the main takeaways that I have is there's still the inconsistency, like 2023, where there's offense, then there's not. Kind of some question marks at times with the bullpen and how they're going to get through that. With the rotation, there's question marks there a little bit as well, you know. With Darvish and Musgrove, they don't go deep in this game. The bullpen has to get used. Michael King did not like his outing at all. So the rotation is a question mark. It's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. I like the rotation. Musgrove, Darvish, King, Cease, and then Brito, Waldron. Like I like the names there, but all I can say is what I think of these two games that matter. And so far, starting pitching has been a little bit underwhelming. I thought Darvish had a solid outing considering the pitch count he didn't allow any earned runs that was the Tyler Wade error but Musgrove obviously was not at his best and Darvish didn't go as long as the Padres would have probably liked and that's why they had to use a ton of relievers so we'll see you know Michael King that was a little disappointing seeing what Michael King did there but he's not starting he was coming out of the bullpen it's his first outing he's confident that he's going to be able to find it so I'm not going to freak out too much but I think it's fair to still say that the rotation as of now is still a little bit of a question mark. And then the offense, it's a little bit of a question mark as well. Like both sides are a little bit of a question mark because of the offense, the inconsistency in these two games. It's a very small sample size, but the offense underwhelming, I thought, in game one. And then game two, they blow it open. 
And so it's a reminder of 2023 and that season. That's what I got from this series. Um, I mean, let's get into game two here. And if you have any thoughts, if you want to join the show, you can click that link that is pinned up at the top of the chat. I will get into the comments as well, live on this show in a little bit. But yeah, just going through what happened here in this game. First inning off of Yamamoto. You don't know what to expect. Well, first off, let me just say my freaking alarm didn't go off. I set it for one o'clock in the morning. I thought that's two hours before the game. I was like, I'm going to be good. And I ended up waking up in the four o'clock hour here on the West Coast. So that's that was not great to, to wake up like that and be like, oh, game's you know, probably in the fifth inning, I wake up, see what the score is, and hey, at least they're winning. But Musgrove kind of crapped the bed a little bit, and so that was not that was not too fun to um, relive there. But I was happy that they got the lead. They smacked off. They they smacked Yamamoto, um, took him out of the game really early, made the Dodgers obviously go to the bullpen really early, and huge games from guys that are question marks going into this year, like Jake Cronenworth. Um, I didn't know if the Padres were going to be able to get a home run in this series, but Manny has a huge home run there when they're up by one late big home run. And, you know, that that allowed some breathing room there for Robert Suarez, who was throwing gas. He was throwing like 100 up there. So that was encouraging to see. Um, but it was it was a good, really good start to this game. Couldn't have been a better start. Excuse me. <coughs> Couldn't have been a better start. Crony with the triple. Made it 2 nothing down the line. Kim with a sack fly. Didn't have the best series, but it was still cool, you know, going back to South Korea for him. And he had a lot on his plate. So I'm not going to sit here and, you know, overreact to any maybe Ha Sung Kim like struggles. You see everyone else in the lineup do a lot. And Kim went 0 for 4. I'm not going to overreact to that. He is, he's probably really gassed right now. Um, Campy with the double. Down the line, Max Muncy. I mean, give it up for Max Muncy, huh? Wow. What a game at third base for the Dodger third baseman. I mean, this guy, like, it was like he didn't know how to play third base. Booting balls all over the place. Obviously, I'm not complaining. That was great. Without those Muncy errors, I wonder what this game would have looked like. Um, but you could do that with a lot of things. I mean, what about yesterday in game one? What if Jake Cronenworth, that ball wouldn't have gone through his mitt and the Padres turn a double play there? What would have happened there? It would have been a tie game still instead of the Dodgers having the lead and then they don't give it back up, obviously. You know, what What would have happened? Um, so we could do that all day. But, you know, with Yamamoto, there wasn't much of a scouting report. I mean, sure, you could look at his Japan stuff. But in terms of MLB scouting report, he'd never pitched in the big leagues in a regular season game before. And so I think when Xander got him right out of the gate, it seems like he didn't want to use his fastball very much. And then he's floating up 92 miles per hour. And even Tyler Wade is, I'm not saying Tyler Wade sucks, but I'm just saying like Tyler Wade, he's not Tatis. He's not Bogarts. He's not Manny. Um, he just takes it to right field. And it was hard contact. And I don't think the, I don't think Yamamoto was like tipping pitches. I think that he was leaving balls over the middle of the plate, and it just wasn't great. Um, he didn't have great command. And Dave Roberts even said at post game about how Yamamoto he's not totally a velocity guy. Like he's he relies on his command, and when that command is not there, well, that happens. Um, we know the Padres they have some talent in the lineup. Like that showed today when a pitcher is not on their game. I just wonder when they have to face Yamamoto when he is on his game, how is that going to work out? Uh, but at the same time, the Dodgers will have to face Musgrove when he is on his game. How is that going to work out? And, and when Darvish is pitching better, how is that going to work out? Um, you know, Otani, there's all that stuff going on with Otani, obviously, and it's so confusing. If people want me to talk about it more, I can talk about it here in a little bit. But him offensively, he had a really good series. Um, and, and Mookie Betts, with a home run today and he had a pretty good offensive series and he kept the Dodgers in this game until obviously the Manny big home run. And yeah, of course it was a little worrisome, you know, when it was a one run game there and it's like Padres were up nine to two at one point in this game 
and you're letting the Dodgers creep back in and it's a one run game. I mean, come on. If you choke, imagine if the Padres would have choked this game and they're down 0 2, 0 and 2, their record, long flight home. And then you have to go through Fan Fest. You have to go through what's already going to be probably pretty sad the Peter Seidler Memorial. I mean, that would just suck. And you have to sit on this until Thursday, a full week that you have to sit on this because the exhibition games, you win those games, who cares? So it was good. You know, they they were fighting. Obviously, that's a that's a term that Musgrove used. He thinks that he fights well, and I agree. When he doesn't have his stuff, I think he, he fights well on the mound trying to make do with what he had. Um, I saw some people, I forget who exactly it was, but they were like, well, Musgrove today, he wasn't pitching like he had a huge lead. And that might have been part of the problem. Like he was trying to be so perfect and his command wasn't great with the breaking ball. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but I'm sure Musgrove also had a game plan on how he was going to attack these Dodger hitters. I don't think that just goes right out the door when you have a lead. I think with Musgrove as a competitor and he prepared for this outing, they're going to go with how they prepared. And if it doesn't, if he doesn't have it, okay, he has to adjust and then make do with what he had. But yeah, it was not the best outing from Joe, definitely. I mean, two and two thirds innings, five earned runs, walked two, only struck out two, gave up seven hits. Um, yeah, you need more length out of Joe Musgrove, even if it's March 21st. With Darvish, yeah, you want more length out of him as well, but I go back to the no earned runs thing. Where Musgrove, he gave up five earned runs. So that's where there's the difference there, right? And Musgrove had some not so great spring training outings as well, but then it seemed like he found it and it was encouraging. Then this happened, so it's a step back. But it's also, I was saying on my initial reaction this morning, I, I'm not going to, maybe I didn't hit specifically on Musgrove, but I'm not going to panic about Joe Musgrove. I'm going to say, hey, it's a question mark right now, this rotation. You know, we're not everyone is even pitched in this rotation in a big league game out of, you know, not coming out of the bullpen. Like King came out of the bullpen. He hasn't started yet. Walton hasn't started yet. Um, Cease hasn't started yet in a regular season game here for this Padres team this season. So there's still question marks of who these guys are going to be. And even when they do start, I'm not going to use a one start sample size and say, all right, you got to worry, got to worry. I, I think right now I'm not worried about it. I am just stating that it's still a question mark, but I'm not you know, losing sleep over what the rotation looks like. And, oh, Musgrove didn't get through three innings today. It's it's one of those games when there's so much runs like that and you do have that cushion, just win the game. I'm going to take the positives from the offense. I'm going to look at the bigger sample size of Joe Musgrove when he's been with the Padres. And for the most part, he's been one of their best pitchers. And he got $100 million for a reason. Um, and last year, sure, slow start. He did have the injuries, obviously, which were not ideal. I'm not talking about the one that ended his season, but obviously the stuff before. But his last like 12 starts, I believe, were all quality starts. And he finished the year after that Yankee out, or I think the Yankee outing last year at Yankee Stadium was the first good outing. And then since then, before he had to shut it down, he pitched really well. So let's not forget about that. Let's not forget about some of the postseason outings that he's had. Like, so I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and be super worried about Joe Musgrove's performance today. Again, it wasn't ideal, but I'm happy that the offense broke out and at least like we know they're capable of that. And I think Xander had a quote post game about how they could have just lied down. I don't really buy I don't I don't buy that. I guess they could have just lied down, but when you have this whole mindset that you're talking about in spring training, and I'm sure they were talking about in the off season as well. And you're just going to not do that mindset in game two of 162, just because you lost a tough game one. You're not going to bring that mindset of who cares what happened in game one. Let's worry about this game. Let's go win this day. We can't control what happened in the past. Let's just go do it in game two. I don't think that, you know, just rolling over and just, you know, not, giving that great effort and not being super dialed in. I don't think that was really an option. Like you're playing the Dodgers soul series game two of 162. I'm sure those guys are still motivated to not go. zero and two to start the year. So I don't really buy the whole, the whole, we could have just lied down thing. 
especially coming off of last year. I don't think that there's really a, an option, but I'm still going to give credit, obviously, to this Padres offense. I mean, 10 for 24 with runners in scoring position. Pretty darn good. 10 hits with runners in scoring position. And Jackson Merrill, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't, keep, don't take him out of that nine spot, at least right now. It's a small sample size, but as of now, he looks pretty darn comfortable in the big leagues. Doesn't look too um, small for the moment. Um, you know, the lights aren't too bright. Now we'll see what happens when he get back. He gets back to Petco, and you're you're going through the daily grind of a season, not just two games and then a week off. Um, but if he continues to hit like this, then sure, maybe you move him up in the order. But having having him in the nine spot like that, it's a lefty bat before some righties come up at the top. And if he's getting on base, that sets up the top of the order with someone on base, and that allows for Xander, who's not the biggest power guy, he gets on, and then you have Tatis coming up. You have Cronenworth coming up as a lefty, who had another, or not another, he had a great offensive game today, right? Then you have Manny, who had, has a huge home run. My, my goodness, that ball was, you, you can you hit a ball better than that? I, I know it was 88 right down the middle, but holy cow. That was crushed. I don't think you can hit a baseball better than Manny hit that late in this game. Um, but yeah, I think Merrill, you know, batting ninth, people say second leadoff. I mean, that's really actually what this is. If Merrill can have the approach that he had in spring training and he's he can hit the ball like he has uh, in these last couple of games against the Dodgers in the Soul Series, almost hit a home run today. Um, he, was, he was saying, I think post game, like, dude, in any other ballpark, talking to, to Kevin AC, like in any other ballpark, that could have been a home run. Um, he got his first big league hit, obviously, two hits in this game. Um, it, it's two games, but you look at the OPSs of these Padres players, and it looks pretty good. And obviously, most of that is because of what happened um, in today's game. And you obviously just hope that they continue moving that um, forward, that, that approach that they have, that relentless they strike us. We're not just going to sit there and let it happen and let us be punched. We're punching back. We might have a lead, but we're going to keep scoring runs here. Five nothing lead. We're not going to let off. We're going to keep scoring runs. We're going to score ten more runs after we score five. Uh, that's relentlessness. Continue to fight. Not give up in at bat. Not give up a pitch. Like that's what this team needs to do, um, especially when like they're considered an underdog and. Some consider, like, man, it's a it's a, a top-heavy lineup. There's not great talent throughout the order. This is not the Dodgers that we're talking about. This isn't the Braves lineup that we are talking about here. So they've got to be grinding through at-bats. And I know they lost in game one, but the little thing like Profar the bunt to third, don't, don't, don't forget about that. And he gets on base, and can't be, yeah, he grounded into the double play, but that brought a run in. Like, doing the little things like that. Ha Sung Kim... Um, getting the fly ball, um, that that scored a run, right? Yeah, because Crony was on. Did Crony score on that? I forget if he scored on that. But like Kim doing the little thing, ball down in the zone, get the ball in the air, even if it's down the zone, get it to the outfield, score a run, however you can. Um, I like this Padres offense's uh, approach here, especially obviously this morning against the Dodgers. Um, and you know, lighting up Yamamoto, it's great to see. I mean. The Dodgers, they took a huge risk giving Yamamoto $325 million. I'm not saying that that's not going to work out, but that's not a good start to the $325 million contract. You, you going one inning. I get it. It's his first big league outing. Dodger fans, they're probably not going to sit here and be like, I'm worried about Yamamoto. Um, but in the back of their minds, they probably got to be a little bit worried. I mean, some agents have a point. Some people, if they have this opinion, they have a point. Go with the guarantee that has already had a couple Cy Youngs in baseball. There's question marks with Blake Snell, but maybe go with him over giving Yamamoto $325 million. Now, there are plenty of teams that were trying to give Yamamoto a big deal, 300 mil. I think the Yankees may have gone there, the Mets, Phillies maybe, if I remember correctly. Like Teams were in on Yamamoto. This was not just the Dodgers going out by themselves and giving Yamamoto a ton of money. Most money on a contract in Major League Baseball history by a pitcher, right? So I don't think that the Dodgers made a terrible decision. It's just a lot of money 
to give to one guy. And you're giving him $325 million to be like the best pitcher in baseball, not to be a three or four starter caliber. And it's just not a good start. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that this Yamamoto signing is going to be, is going to look, going to be looked at as a huge bust and a huge waste of money. Uh, but I'm sure that there's a little bit of worriness. Uh, maybe maybe not with the Dodgers because they they're they're around Yamamoto and they see the bullpens and they probably are looking at video and they already know what the heck went wrong. But Dodger fans, there's there's probably they're not going to admit it, but there's probably a little bit um, of some worriness there. Out of the bullpen for the Padres today, Cosgrove, uh, Michael King, he did not like his outing at all. There is that quote in the UT. I want to see. I think it's in this one here. Yeah, I mean, he admitted it. This reminded me of Rich Hill. You know how blunt and honest Rich Hill is? Michael King was not pleased with his first outing for the Padres, Kevin Acey says here. Um, King says, it was pretty bad. It's obviously great when we put up 15 runs and I just have to kind of keep them at bay, but I felt terrible in my command. My, my mechanics just felt a little off, and every adjustment I was making was either overcorrecting or... I just didn't find that rhythm. I know I will in my next one. King had a good spring for from what I saw from uh, just people that were there in Peoria. It seems like he had a good spring. So I'm not going to overreact to one appearance that wasn't even a start, an appearance out of the bullpen. Um, but still, I think it's fine to say it's still a question mark on what Michael King is going to do as a starting pitcher in this rotation. I know Padres fans, it feels like they have a super high expectation that I'm seeing on social media. Like, man, Michael King better be that better be better than Seth Lugo um, when he's the main piece coming back in that Juan Soto trade. But I'm just going to say, maybe give it a little bit of time. And Seth Lugo, he was solid for the Padres. He wasn't the reason why they missed the postseason last year. So if Michael King can do that as the four starter, especially with Cease coming in, and if Cease could be Dylan Cease, not last year's Dylan Cease, but the other year, uh, 2022 and just, you know, give innings, give starts, stay healthy. That puts less pressure on Michael King. And if Michael King, again, if he can be like Seth Lugo a little bit better, that's a pretty darn good four starter in your rotation. Um, so yeah, with Michael King, he didn't like it, but he knows that. And it seems like he knows that he will be trying to, uh, or maybe he already knows what the heck he's, I mean, he said right there about not being in rhythm. So it seems like he has a good idea of what went wrong. And obviously Ruben Diabla, Ben Fritz, the the staff, um, seems like they're, they know what the heck they're talking about as well. So I, I'm not at this point where I'm worrying about Michael King or Joe Musgrove or you Darvish. I guess the only thing that you might worry about is like their health, but it seems like they're healthy and obviously full go here to start the year. So that is encouraging. I see Carter wants to join the show. What's up, Carter? Can you hear me? Yo, what's up? What's up? What would you want to talk series? about? Yeah. I just, I love that series. It was awesome to watch. I, I was one of those you... fans that, I was one of those fans that woke up early. Yeah? Yeah, I'm see. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What were you saying? No, no, no. Yeah, I, I woke up first game early, and I was going to do the same thing second game, and then my alarm didn't go off so i woke up in the middle of the second game which i was happy that you know the padres were putting up a ton of runs because that would have been a little worrisome if they weren't able to i'm not saying they had to put up 15 runs but if they had another underwhelming day offensively i think a lot of padres fans would be freaking out a little bit here yeah that that game kind of remind me of um the mexico city game not not because of how the the like the the plays, but I just thought it kind of remind me of the Mexico City game because of how high scoring the game was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when when I make those comparisons, I'm not saying like oh because there was a ton of home runs. Like it was the opposite, but there was just a ton of runs scored by both teams, and it was like oh my gosh, yep. this is a game that we're probably not going to see at all the rest of the year. I don't I don't think the Padres are going to you know be scoring 15 runs. Maybe maybe like once, but they're not going to score 15 runs and the other team's going to score uh, 11 runs any time the rest of the year. Like, this was just such a unique game. And then uh, we 
we have those expedition games, correct? Yeah, against uh, Seattle on Monday and Tuesday. That's right. And then FanFest, too? Yeah, FanFest is on Sunday. The Peter Seidler Memorial uh, is going to be on Saturday or the Celebration of Life. Um, and then Monday, Tuesday, exhibition games. Wednesday, off day. Thursday is the home opener. Man, I, I can't wait, dude. I'm so excited. Yeah, I, I think you speak for a lot of people. Carter, thanks so much, man. No problem. Thanks for having me. Of course. If anyone else wants to join the show as well, feel free. Um, click that link pinned up at the top of the chat. I love giving Padres fans that platform to come on and talk. Um, I, I try to be the most interactive Padres show um, out there. Um, I'm just – some some say – there was a comment, I think, on YouTube I saw the other day about like thanking me for professionalism. I don't know if I view myself like that. I mean, I'm knowledgeable about the team, and I, I care about giving fans like the right information. Um, I get asked questions all the time about the team and certain information about the team and what they need to know about the team and all that, and I, I give that, but I'm, I'm just a, a passionate Padres fan. So if you watch like every show, you'll know I'll go, I'll go off sometimes, but then there's some times where I'm more calm because – I'm not going to sit here and like fake rage something if I'm not actually pissed off about something. Uh, Pedro, what's up, man? Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, the Shilty arrows in full effect. And I was I was one of the ones that was kind of going for Benji Gill or someone kind of more hardcore. You saw Ozzy Guillen take care of business in the what the Caribe World the little series. So yeah. I was kind of like leaning that way but you could tell that Schilty's kind of he has that effect with the the players he's kind of there's a different mindset you know the even game one the game was ours but you know stuff happens it's baseball but you know it, you could see totally like these guys are uh laser you know they're fighting for jobs like you know the the roster's not set when they come back so those those little last spots you could tell they're like uh crawling and scratching it you know the with uh wade you know shout out marietta yeah. uh and with uh even what is it polly you know he he got his little hit i guess on that bat there but you know i'm, I'm kind of impressed already with the shilt there even though he, you know he he personifies that like haha like kind of sarcastic demeanor with the, the the media i'm waiting to see when it turns on him when we go on a little slide and how they they kind of because he kind of gives them those little sarcastic remarks, but I, I like it. And then I, I like uh, his whole uh, approach, you know, like he's kind of tough guy behind the scenes. They take care of stuff in the clubhouse. And I think we've, we've seen that little stuff where in, in uh, St. Louis, they kind of, uh, he was like kind of cussing and ranting or uh, ramped the guys up and they went on that little winning streak, right? When they kind of met us in the playoffs and COVID. So yep. I think that's, that's step one. And then, and then, you know, the season's going to take care of itself, you know, injuries, like if Musgrove, you know, like I said on the chat there, you know, he's, it's probably early and he's still working on stuff. So, but I like what I'm seeing with the coach or the manager. So I, I just wanted to kind of get a little shout out there to uh, Schilt there, even though it was kind of anti Schilt. So I'm, yeah. I'm eating, I'm eating crow now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, all right. I think with Schilt, I love the Schilt hiring considering the circumstances at the time. Yeah. I like the detailed baseball that they're playing, like how much that's been preached. I think some fans may be like, Hey, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about that. Like let's, let's, let's see how it actually works during the season. Yeah. As of now, it's off to a good start. I think it's the same thing with Jackson Merrill. Like right now it's off to a good start. I'm excited yeah. about it. I'm excited about Mike Schild as the manager, but as you said, yeah, let's see what happens when failure happens. Cause it's going to happen. Baseball yeah, yeah. is a game of failure. It like, what is going to happen then in a long season? Or, or I, think even, I think with this Dodgers series, like it's easy to go all out for these two games, but what's going to yeah. happen all season long? Are they going to be able to Correct, do this yeah. throughout the entirety of the season, or are they going to yeah. go back into those old habits um, that has ended up hurting them in years past, including obviously last year? But yeah, it's it's off to a good start. I'm, I'm definitely liking the Schilt higher. Yeah, um, cool. just, yeah. let's, let's just see. What's going to happen, you know, how, how much consistency is there going to be throughout the year? But, you know, Schilt, he's he's a baseball lifer, baseball nut. Um, and I think that's something that obviously pairs well, for sure. With and he's kind of like a, a mini micromanager, kind of like uh, Preller. No, he kind of likes the notepad stuff like they've, they've kind of documented. So 
he's on top of it. If something's uh, going wrong, he's going to, I don't think he's going to let it slide. Like what we, what Bowmel kind of, we perceived, he was just kind of easygoing, mm -hmm. laissez-faire type uh, uh, manager. Uh, but I think this guy's on top of it and he's going to nip, nip, nip it in the bud before, you know, anything happens. But I uh, just want to give a shout out. And hey, those were good wins for, to start the season in. And, and and I guess like with this in the chat, what are your thoughts? I know you're gonna probably bring it up later about the Otani situation. That that's kind of crazy. Like that nowadays, like with alerts and Bitcoin, you know, he he didn't, he wasn't like privy to nothing. And those guys drive together, exercise together. But I'll let you guys uh, there, and then I'll leave it at the chat there. Yeah, All thank right. you, Pedro. Yeah, I'll get into that. Um, I'll take a quick break. And then we can get into that as well, because obviously the Padres were playing the Dodgers in this series when that story came out. And I think a lot of the focus came, went into that instead of the baseball, which is totally understandable. I mean, this was a huge story that came out. So I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Check out Gaglione Bros famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries on Friars Road. You can visit their website, gaglionebros.com, for their entire menu and enjoy their cheesesteaks and fries at Petco Park and Snapdragon Stadium as well. All right, some of the other great partners of the show, Breaking Tea, San Diego Sports Sweatshirts and Shirts, Padres, Aztecs, Wave. Aztecs play tomorrow, 10.45 a.m. Can't wait for that. The Wave home opener on Saturday. Um, so maybe some are going to be going to the Scyther Celebration of Life, then they can pop over to Snapdragon Stadium for that. Underdog Fantasy, which it's interesting for me to be you know, promoting that, talking about, you know, with the whole Shohei stuff, but 100% deposit match up to $100 there. Code Talking Friars or click the link in the description. A bunch of higher lowers, obviously, with the baseball season about to get started for the rest of baseball, not just uh, the Padres coming up next week, and then obviously other sports as well. Obviously, NCAA tournament going on right now, so there's a ton to pick there. And then SeatGeek Code Talking Friars, $20 off your order, your first order there with SeatGeek, again, code Talking Friars. I see Jeff is in here. I'm going to go to Jeff, and then we can talk about the Otani situation. What's up, Jeff? Hey, good. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. So I just want to talk real quick about stats. I know it's early in the season, yeah. but um, I think it's important to know that the starting pitching, uh, the Padres went 6.1 innings with their starting pitching, scored, gave up five runs well the dodgers went six innings gave up seven runs so we outperformed them there the bullpens both gave up 10 runs the dodgers allowed three errors well we only allowed two errors and then the biggest difference is we led with 14 innings we had a lead and they only had two innings with the lead it's pretty crazy well, that's yeah exactly to to end up with a 1-1 one, one split there I, I think we're already encouraged by the 1-1 one, one split but to have those numbers, you know, you, you tell me those numbers, it's like, man, the, the Padres were close to winning both games. Yeah. And I'm not saying that based on two games here, the Padres, oh, they're going to contend with the Dodgers in the NL West. I think the Dodgers are still going to go win the division. But in it, I think this can show like short series like this, Padres, Dodgers, they can go beat this Dodgers team in the postseason. It's about getting into this postseason and then you see what happens. And obviously, season's just starting. We've got a long way to go. Um, but at the same time, like, it's encouraging for sure that they came out with a 1-1 split. Going in, I think we would have said, yeah, 1-1 split, we'll be happy. I think we're even happier because of some of the encouraging signs like that. I know that there's questions with starting pitching, but, like, they, they were able to be better than the Dodgers for most of this series. Um, and so I, I think that's encouraging. It's not like this was where the Padres had all their healthy players and the Dodgers didn't. Like, they went right with the Dodgers, right up against each other, and they smacked Yamamoto. Um, Glass now pitched well, but the Padres were stay, still able to win this game with Musgrove not performing up to the level of expectation, with guys not going long. And I think that could be encouraging because I think that this, especially the top of the rotation, as long as they're healthy, like they're and they're not going to continue to be this bad. Like Darvish, I thought it was a solid outing, um, considering like he didn't give up any runs and the high the higher pitch count. It was going to be a limited pitch count, but more like Musgrove. Like that's not going to continue to happen. 
Yeah, no, for sure. It's still early, but we were able to go head and head with the uh, number one offense. So it's a good sign. Yeah, for sure. All right, Jeff. Thanks so Thank much you. for coming, man. All right. Yeah, see ya. Um, yeah, let's get to the Otani situation. I appreciate everyone that has joined the show so far. Love the participation. Again, if you want to join the show, you can click that link pinned up at the top of the chat. I will get to the rest of the chat in a little bit. But yeah, the Shohei Otani situation. I already did a video on this, so you can check that out. I did that last night because um, I that, that story was just so huge last night that I'm like, I have to do a video on this. I mean, this is so wild. I don't know. I, I didn't know at the time, like, was Shohei going to play? I thought he was going to play. The Dodgers aren't going to take him out of the lineup if they don't have to, right? If they take him out of the lineup, that means he's probably suspended. They're not going to just take him out of the lineup and say, no, we're going to take our, you know, the best player on the planet out of our lineup that we're paying a ton of money to. I know it's some, most of it's deferred, but we're paying a ton of money to this guy. He's our superstar, one of our superstars, face of the franchise, face of the league. I'm not taking this guy out in case something happened. No. Unless we see that, okay, something happened and Major League Baseball is like making us take him out, then they'll take him out. But yeah, Shohei's going to keep playing. So I, I just thought maybe would would there be like a, a little bit of a distraction? What was this going to look like? But, you know, sh credit to Shohei, I guess. He, he performed really well for the Dodgers even in this game today. Almost hit a home run multiple times. Um, and He's a ridiculously talented baseball player. Face of the league, looks like he can do no wrong, and that's part of the reason why how, how like big of a story this is. It, like Ipe, his former translator, by the way, Ipe, he's no longer with the Dodgers, so he wasn't going to be on the team flight home, I wouldn't think. So is he just taking a commercial flight from Seoul back to L.A.? And wouldn't that be awkward? him having to talk to Dodger fans if they're on the same flight about what the heck happened? Because everyone knows what Ipe looks like. If you're a baseball fan, Ipe follows Shohei all over the place because of he's the interpreter. Like, they're best friends as well is what it seems like. Um, and you, so you've seen Ipe at press conferences right next to Shohei, all-star game interviews on MLB Network. He, he's everywhere. Um, so that has to be interesting. But yeah, there's, there's a couple sides of this story i mean you've got shohei's side that is saying that ipe or maybe are they accusing i think we're all assuming that they're accusing ipe of doing this right but his team just they didn't accuse ipe they said that shohei otani is a victim of massive theft but ipe is literally the only other person that's in the story so they're referring to ipe shohei's camp allowed Ipe to have an interview for 90 minutes with ESPN. Ipe told one side, said some things, and then he backtracks on that and said, no, 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 Shohei didn't know what was going on when initially, I believe this was initially, in that big 90-minute interview with ESPN said, no, Shohei was covering my debt and being nice, wanted to make sure I'd never do it again, but then said that, no, Shohei had no knowledge of it. Like, which one is it? And Shohei's team is saying that, yep, massive theft. Shohei's name, though, is on the wire transfers up to a million dollars, at least the two $500,000 payments that are there that were that were seen, I believe, by ESPN. And so Shohei's side, no, no, no. Shohei didn't know. They're obviously protecting Shohei. I mean, these people, these people's jobs is to make their client look good protect their client. So I'm not going to believe everything that comes out of their mouth. Should I believe everything that comes out of Ipe's mouth either? Heck no. Because one time he talks to ESPN and says one thing that Shohei used his laptop and it was under Ipe's supervision. He was covering my gambling debt. I was really bad at it. And then another is saying, no, 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 Shohei didn't know anything about it. It was all me. It was all me. When Shohei's name is on the, the wire transfers, like what's the actual story here? Um, I said this yesterday, and maybe I just can't relate because I don't have $4.5 million to give to a friend, or I don't have a friend that has 
four and a half million dollars to cover a debt of mine. But that just seems fishy that, yes, Soe Otani, four and a half million dollars is nothing to him. But to give four and a half million dollars under your name to an illegal gambler um, person that hooks, hooked Ipe up, obviously, to do that, to cover a friend's gambling debt, and you're doing it on your laptop, it just seems fishy. And they allow a 90-minute interview, and then Shohei's side is like, no, 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 we're, we're trying to, they just try to disassociate themselves as far as possible from Ipe. And yep, Ipe, he's fired. No, 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 don't believe anything that he's saying. We're not responsible for that, even though we just let you talk to him for 90 minutes. But then Ipe's changing the story as well. So like, it's hard to know what to believe. I mean, after the game, the Dodgers PR staff, I think there was multiple, is what I saw, around Shohei Otani as he's changing. And then they walk him out of the clubhouse with reporters not being able to talk to him. And I guess Shohei, all he said was have a good night in Japanese or whatever. And I'm like, well, shocker, he's not addressing the media. He rarely addresses the media anyway. And there's no um, accountability, it seems like, for Shohei. He only talks to the media when he does well. And when this happened, I get like, it's probably not the smartest thing to talk to the media right now. But if nothing went wrong, you did nothing wrong, then why not talk? Ipe's already been fired. Now, maybe that relationship is totally great. I mean, before Ipe went in front of the Dodger clubhouse and said, um, like, it was all him and he had a gambling problem and a story's going to come out minutes before that, right? At least we assume it was minutes before that. Ipe and Shohei were smiling with each other in the dugout at the end of yesterday morning's game. So it's just weird. What is happening? It's weird. If nothing was wrong, wouldn't it be smart for Shohei to go out in front and say, I didn't do anything. I know I didn't do anything. That's why I'm talking. But when you don't talk and you have PR people be your security guards in the clubhouse because you don't want uh, the media to talk to you, you, you really don't want to speak to the media. It just seems a little fishy. So Major League Baseball is going to do everything they can to protect Shohei Otani because Shohei Otani is the face of the game and it would be a terrible look for Shohei to be suspended or for anything to happen. So I don't know how long this thing's going to take. What I do know is he's going to keep playing baseball. They're not going to sit Shohei out unless he has to because he is suspended or you know something happens really bad with like government or whatever, you know, legal. Uh, Major League Baseball, I don't think they've launched any investigation or anything on it. Because why would they want to do that? It's Shohei Otani. They don't want to do that unless they have to. So this might drag on a little bit. This is not the end to this story. I, I've seen some updates throughout the day on it. Um, it's just, it's confusing. And things aren't adding up. Stories are getting changed from both sides. It's just not adding up. So I, I don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. We know things that have been reported, but yeah, I'm just, I'll say this, looping it back to the Padres. I'm glad the Padres aren't the team with the drama right now. We've dealt with plenty of drama in the last couple of years as Padres fans with Tatis, with Preller and Melvin and Soto a little bit and just the clubhouse and all that. There's so much drama. I'm glad that it's on the Dodgers side of things now. And they already had a ton of pressure going into the season, and now there's even more attention on them for something that none of us were expecting. Um, I see David. He is in here, wants to join the show. What's up, David? Um, hi. Uh, I know I sound a little bit, a little bit young, but <laughs> um, after the game, I was sitting in the car. I was on my phone, and then I saw the story as my dad called me, and I immediately screamed because, like, this is this is huge. Like, well, first of all, why why do you why do you gamble? It's not really the smartest thing, especially when you keep losing. The second thing is like, why why would you rob? And the third thing is, why would you rob from Shohei, like the face of the game, like you just said? Yeah, exactly. And, like, and, yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you keep talking, David. But yeah, like the why why was 
this per- let's say it was Ipe. Why was Ipe allowed to be in four and a half million dollars of debt? And did the per- because the person just saw that oh Shohei's name is on it, so Shohei will pay back because he's loaded with money. If it was Shohei, why? Who cares if it's Shohei Otani? Like, why are you allowed to be in four and a half million dollars of debt? Why do you keep betting? I mean, you have a problem, but why do you keep doing that when you have so much debt? And yeah, it's it's so crazy. But yeah, keep going. Yeah, it's like if you have a debt and and you're paying for a house, you're just not going to keep buying stuff and investing if you're not going to get the money back. And then another thing is just like the story. I'm confused. Like we were, I'm pretty sure we were all told as kids that a you don't want to lie in the first place, but if you do end up at least keep the same story. But he clearly did not listen. And now he's getting even more backlash because he keeps changing the story and the same with the other side. And we're all confused and we don't even know who's really going to get convicted or anything or anybody does or like blame because the story is changing 18 different times every day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ipe is like flip-flopping on this. And it's it's one thing if, okay, you're lying, but you're sticking with the story. Then when you flip it, it's like, well, you clearly there's clearly something wrong here and you clearly did something wrong. Because there's two sides of it. And so you're admitting whether one thing was a lie, one of them is somewhat accurate. So something like Ipe is in trouble. There's a reason he got fired um, and he's no longer Shohei's interpreter. Um, I think obviously the greater interest is what does this mean for Shohei Otani? What the heck's going to happen there? Um, Yeah, it's... It's not something like I said. It's not something that we were expecting to like come down or anything like that. But and also another thing, for Shohei, I think one of the reports coming out today was like Shohei didn't know until Ipe talked to the Dodgers, and I'm like, so Shohei, you're so loose with your finances. I get that Ipe is like the closest person to you, but you're allowing Ipe to use your name in a transfer to an illegal uh, bookie, I believe. How is that like Shohei has to be at fault there as well? Like that's that's on you, dude. And it's under your name. Even if you didn't do it, it's under your name. So he has to be at fault here somewhat. Um, but again, Major League Baseball, they're gonna do everything to protect this, uh, or protect him, um, uh, because that protects their image and extension. It brings in money, obviously, because of how many people want to go watch Shohei Otani. Um, so yeah, I do you have any more thoughts on this? This is just, it's bizarre. And this is not the end of it. Like, I, I don't know if reporting's going to come out every day about this thing, mm-hmm. but at some point we're going to hear the, maybe not the entire story, but there's definitely more information that has to come out because we're hearing conflicting stories here and it's not adding up. And at some point it's going to have to add up. Yeah. Um. Just a few more things before I go. Like, I don't believe that Shohei didn't know because, a, in the first story, I'm pretty sure he said that Shohei Otani was wiring the money. I don't believe that he didn't know what he was doing. He's not dumb. Like, he, he knows what he's doing. And the second one, him not knowing, I'm pretty sure Shohei would know if $4.5 million was taken out of his account just randomly. Yeah, exactly. I get that Shohei has a ton of money, but let, let's let's narrow it down to, like, a normal human, not, like, a, a billionaire or a millionaire, however much money he has. Let's say you have $4,000 in your, your bank account. And all of a sudden, you're down to two thousand, and you didn't do anything. You you don't notice that, like, sh- sh- so Shohei doesn't check his Chase account or his Wells Fargo, or y- he just don't know. He doesn't have alerts because there's alerts that happen when you make a huge payment of something. You get an email about, yep, here's like the receipt. And it's like you don't notice that. So yeah, and there was the part of the story in, on the ESPN article was like, it was Shohei on his laptop. That was part of, I believe what Ipe said initially. And then he was like, no, no, no. Shohei doesn't know. He didn't know anything. It was all me. Like one thing is right. One thing is wrong. But for you to be flipping, like stick, at least if you're going to lie and you shouldn't, but stick to that lie instead of changing the story. I, I don't get why he changed the story. That That didn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, you're you're counting it out of it, and then you dig yourself a bigger hole, and now you're basically screwed because you're fired, and now you're probably going to get convicted of some crime. It, it's just crazy. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on just this Padres Dodgers Soul Series? Any main takeaways? Just outlook on this season? 
I mean, yeah, it was a great series. I watched both games. I'm on the East Coast, so oh. I got to sleep a little bit more than you. Um, I was watching both games. The first game, I ended up watching until I'm pretty sure the seventh or eighth inning when the Padres decided to choke the lead. And I was mad. I wanted to punch a wall, but I was it was okay. It was the first game of the season. It's hard to keep, you know, that lineup with Shohei and Freddie and Mookie and all of them uh, at bay. Second game, I cannot tell you how much my heart rate went up and down through that game. Because first we were winning five to five to zero, and then it was like five to two, and then it was nine, and then it was like six, and then it was just crazy. And then the final score just shows how crazy this game was. It was back and forth. Like the pitching did not exist in this game. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. The pitching only existed like at the very end with Robert Torres. I thought he he pitched well. He was throwing gas. Uh, I, I'm someone that appreciates good pitching and low scoring and just kind of trying to see, okay, who's going to come up with that big hit, the big swing. But when you have a, a one-off like this where there is just – it, the game's drunk. There, there's so many hits, so many runs being scored. It, it's super, super entertaining. So, yeah, no doubt this was a memorable series. Um, I wish I was up for the entire game, but I, I didn't have to see all of, you know, Musgrove not pitching that well. So I guess there's the positive of that. Um, David, thank you so much for coming on, man. All right. Let's see here. Going through the chat. Padres up says, I, I thought King looked great. I don't know what game you were watching then. MCC951, happy to get the split. Seems fair for both teams based on the travel and level of disruption due to standard spring. Yeah, I mean, like, the Dodgers and Padres, they go across the world just to be one and one. I think the Padres going in, you're like, yeah, one and one, I'm good with that. But for the Dodgers, that has to be pretty disappointing. When you win game one and then you score 11 runs, you should be winning both games. And they don't. And so, as a Padres fan, very happy about that. Um, Odai says, Machado's home run at the end was a cherry on top. That was such a bomb. You can't hit a baseball better than that. I don't think. LMAO, Max Muncy. Yeah, what what a game for him, huh? Holy cow. Was his glove messed up too? David says, it's hard to hold back the star-studded line that is the Dodgers with Otani, Betts, Freeman, and more. Yeah, I mean, I didn't need to watch this series to know how good the Dodgers lineup was, but it only reconfirms it. Like, holy cow. That, that lineup is going to be hell for a lot of pitching staffs this season and hopefully the Padres are not one of those when they match up again um and some of the matchups that they have the rest of this year um you know in Korea like this like I, I'm I'm glad that they were able to get the split one and one you'll take it and you'll move on I mean it's better than what happened last year right remember last year they were 0 and two and then they came back I believe and then they were two and two but yeah, being 0-2, oh, oh and it was against the Rockies, I believe, right? Um, yeah, wasn't great. Wasn't a great start. So at least it's more of a happy start to the season. And it's definitely, if you're going to pick one game or the other to win, you're going to pick the second game because you get the happy flight. You're like, okay, we split. We just won, especially when you score 15 runs. We just scored 15 runs against the Dodgers. We got Fan Fest. Slubbly softball game, exhibition games, home opener. You're like, okay, we're happy. Now, if they would have won game one and would have scored 11 runs and lost this one like the Dodgers did, that wouldn't have been, we just wouldn't be feeling that great, right? Um, Yuki asked, did Otani pay off a friend's gambling debt or did someone steal four and a half? We don't, I mean, could it be both? Could it be Otani? He gambled. Was it an e? What, did Epe do the bets for him? Did Epe do bets on top of that? Did Epe? Um, was he in debt, so he stole money from Shohei? But the five hundred thousand dollars, those two five hundred 
thousand dollars there that were reported in the ESPN article was that Shohei actually being in debt. So that's why he the the transfers were in his name. I, I don't know. I mean, Shohei's one heck of a friend if this is true, where Ipe uh, was in four and a half million dollars of debt. And Shohei just said, yeah, I'll be a good friend and pay it off for you so you don't do it again. Like, if someone has a problem, obviously Ipe is admitting to it, right? Let's say he does have the problem. He's admitting to it, and he's saying, well, part of his story, one of his versions of his, his story was he, it was all him. It was all his fault, uh, and he's never going to be betting again. But how do you get to $4.5 million of gambling debt? Like, that's a question I have. Holy cow. Uh, Darth Re Revan says, happy for the split, but both you and Joe had mediocre starts at best. You gave up no runs, but only last in three and two-thirds innings at 73 pitches. But I think he was like on the pitch count of less than 80 pitches, around 80. Both pitching staffs in game two were rocked. That's true, yeah. And Musgrove, like, again, I'm not at the point where I'm worried about Musgrove. I need more of a sample size here in the regular season in starts that matter for me to be worried about Joe Musgrove. Um, but, yeah, it's it, the rotation is still a question mark. We can like it on paper, but, of course, it's still a question mark. Just like it's a question mark with a lot of teams, even when they acquire big names in their rotation. And you, you think it's good, you think it's strong, until something happens in the season. Yeah, I saw J.D. Martinez sign with the Mets. That is, what, one year, $12 million, I want to say? Yeah. One year, $12 million. It's kind of weird for the Mets, right? So they're paying J.D. 12 mil to go trade him at the deadline? Because why would they keep him the entire year? I don't think they're going to be in contention. Maybe they'll be in contention, so they have to keep them, but why? Uh, that's a little confusing to me. I was thinking, oh, crap. Padres announced Fan Fest this weekend has been canceled due to inclement weather, and the Peter Seidler celebration of life has been moved up. 11 a.m., so breaking news, 11 a.m. on Saturday is the Peter Seidler Celebration of Life. Canceling Fan Fest. Well, that sucks. Let me see here, because I'm just reading this live, so I'm trying to find the information here that you might need to know. Um, courtesy of Jim Russell, because he gets... Some media emails. The Padres will honor their beloved former chairman and owner, Peter Scyther, with a celebration of life ceremony at Petco on Saturday at 11 a.m. So not 1, I believe, is when it was supposed to start. 11. The home plate gate will open to fans at 10 a.m. Seating will be available on a first-come, first-served basis. Parking free of charge will, will be available in neighboring Padres-controlled lots, including Lexus Premier Lot, Tailgate Lot, and Padres Parkade. Fans will also be able to watch a live stream of the ceremony at Padres.com. Um, FanFest ticket holders will have the opportunity to claim up to four free tickets to attend either Monday's exhibition game or Tuesday. Um, seating for the complimentary tickets will be in the upper deck, right field upper level, left field reserved, and Gallagher Square. And they will be available to claim at Padres.com slash FanFest. Tickets for the low, lower seating bowl are still available for purchase for $20 for adults and $10 for kids ages 14 and under. Padres.com slash tickets. I think a lot, of a lot of fans were looking forward to FanFest, so that stinks. But... Because of the weather on Saturday, moving that up to 11 a.m., I mean, you'd rather have it be with good weather than people being rained on.
if they had tickets for Fan Fest on Sunday, why can't that just transfer over to the Monday or Tuesday exhibition? I guess different barcodes, huh? All right, well, that's what we got right now. That's that's the update there on Fan Fest. No Fan Fest. And that has to suck for the Padres, people that work for the Padres, because they have been probably working their butts off on that for a long time because of everything that goes into it with the players and there was more the the, the Q and A's with the front office people and the players, just fan stuff to do around the ballpark. I mean, because Gallagher Square is still being worked on. That's not going to be ready for opening day because of the weather. I mean, they I think that's what the reasoning is. Even though the Padres had thought they said that they prepared for like days where they couldn't work on it because of the weather. So they like blocked off some time and so they got on it a little bit early so it would be ready, but I guess it's not going to be ready. Um, which that sucks for the Padres. I mean, but it's on them because people that had Gallagher Square tickets, that's that part's going to be blocked off. So that's less money that would be coming in for the Padres, I would think, right? And this is a team that already needs money. Um, JD's third asked, where is Fam? He is a free agent still. Maybe he's living in Vegas. I, I don't know where he's at. That could happen before opening day. I knew that wasn't going to happen during the Soul Series. I mean, they're they're not focused on Tommy Fam. I think the Padres knew that, like, Tommy, he's going to still be out there when they get back home. Um, Andre says, Martinez to the Mets. No. Well, what I'll say about that is, the Padres were never going to sign J.D. Martinez. They weren't going to give any position player $12 million. They're not going to do that to Tommy Pham if Tommy Pham was, if that's what he wants. Not happening. Um, I mean, I know that Waka is a pitcher, but like they weren't giving Lugo Waka $16 million a year. Like they're not, they don't want to do that. They give Profar $1 million, and he's the starting left fielder. Merrill's making nothing as a rookie. Tatis was already here. It was already baked in. But, like, the big contracts, they're gone. That they could trade. Obviously, Soto was the big one. That They're gone. Even, like, Barlow. They traded him for De Los Santos, and they saved money on that deal because and Barlow was making less than $10 million. Like, they were not going to go sign J.D. Martinez for him to DH when Manny's DHing already, and it, it takes up a spot. And you still want these big bats in your order, but maybe you don't want them playing a field every day for a month straight. So, yeah, J.D. wasn't going to happen. J.D.'s a good hitter. I'd love to see him with the Padres. I mean, studies hitting, oppo hitter, like, great. But it, it wasn't going to happen. I, I'm just a little surprised by the Mets signing J.D. Martinez. Yeah, that Bogarts thing that happened today, he got called out for the violation, the pitch clock violation, or the batter violation, I should say. The umpire thought he called timeout earlier in the at-bat, but he didn't. Or excuse me, he did earlier in the at-bat. He didn't when he was called out. It was miscommunication, I think, where, or maybe I'm getting the details flipped. Hang on, because I posted the video of it. Let me go back and look at this real quick. So, okay, so it was a 1-0 count. Xander called strike. Called strike. Looks like he called. He said something to the umpire. It wasn't... I. I thought it was him calling. He he raised his hand to the umpire, not all the way up, but he raised his hand a little bit from where it was, where it's just, you know, resting. He raised a little bit. Maybe the umpire there, he must have thought, okay, he's calling timeout. But Xander, if you watch the video, it's all of 12 seconds. He didn't use the timeout. I mean, the clock's going here. There's 13 seconds left on the clock, and he gets right in the box. So he had plenty of time. And so he probably thought, I didn't use a timeout. I didn't ask for a timeout. And he was pissed off after at the umpire. Like, why would I call timeout? Why would I 
yeah, why would I call timeout after you know, the first pick? Now, when he was called for the violation, Bogart, he was standing in the box. And this is in the eighth inning. It's not like his hand went up while he was had his while he was in the box and his hands were on the bat and called time. He didn't do that. It didn't look like he even said anything. I mean, you can't really tell, but it didn't look like he said anything or he didn't look at the umpire, didn't do anything, anything. So was there a miscommunication on both of those? Xander didn't mean to call timeout the first time. He got right back in the box, had plenty of time. Um, and then this one, he's standing in the box. He is ready to go. The pitch clock is at three when the umpire calls timeout and then gives a violation to Xander. I didn't understand that. That didn't make sense to me. I don't think Xander should have been called for a violation there. There's clearly a misunderstanding. That was not Xander not knowing the rules. Xander knows the rules. This guy is a baseball nut. If there's a baseball nut out of anyone on that Padres team, like Xander is that guy. I mean, he talked about that, like his opening press conference before last season. So he knows the rules. He's a smart baseball guy. So I'm on Bogey's side about this. Chilt got his moment to come out and get a little pissed off. No one got thrown out or anything. But yeah, that was a, an interesting moment there that didn't make sense. And it's one of those where you wish the umpire, you know, on a mic would explain what happened to everyone because you have Don and Mud guessing up there watching this game from their booth. Like, what happened? And so it's frustrating. Pedro says, every hour this Otani news is fluid and changing crazy. You get punished for ringworm cream, but not affiliated with gambling. Yeah. Also, if we remember Tatis, when he got suspended, he didn't talk to the media until, what, the Friday after when the team was back home at Petco? And after he met with Seidler. And so Otani may have to be meeting with people, and he might it might take some time before he talks to the media to, like, script out what he's going to say. It's probably not going to be anything like... Um, it's going to be newsworthy because it, when, if anything Otani says is newsworthy. But I don't think it's going to be something crazy. I don't think he's going to be like, yep, it's all Ipe's fault. I don't think he's going to like say that publicly. He's going to have his team say it because he's trying to protect himself and his team's obviously, that's their job to protect Shohei. Um, I wonder when he's going to talk. He's what? He's going to go the entire season without talking. Let's say this thing doesn't get resolved and he hits two home runs in a game or yeah, hits two home runs because he can't pitch right now. It's two home runs in a game. One's a walk off. He's not going to talk to the media. The, the Dodgers PR people are going to be standing around him in the clubhouse and then escort him out. Like that's where I go to the accountability part. If there's nothing wrong, then talk. So there's obviously something here. So I wonder when he's going to talk. Or if he does talk, Dodgers PR will say, no non-baseball related questions. And then Otani, if he's asked something, he will say no comment. Or he'll tell a new translator, next question. Or he'll he'll say it himself in English, next question. Or he'll he'll say, I can't comment on this. So you're not going to get probably anything from Shohei if he does talk. Um Ricardo asks, is there a reason we're worried about Otani? It's just because this is the biggest story in sports right now, right? It's just so, he's the face of baseball. He's one of the faces of sports. I mean, if you're not a baseball fan, you still probably know Shohei Otani's name. You know the name because you've heard it somewhere. Um, so it's just so big. If, the, if it was Dodgers Giants, would I be talking about it this much? Probably not, but it was in the middle of a Padres Dodgers series. It's just so wild that I, I find myself like it's it's hard not to talk about. Um, let's see here. Ricardo says, how about some Padre chit-chat? I think we've been talking Padres for almost an hour now. I mean, there was Otani talk in there, but most of this has been Padres. I started the show with Padres. I did a post-game reaction about Padres earlier today. It's not like a, this is an Otani channel, but it's a... It's a topic that we like can't get rid of because of how huge it is and how the news is changing all the time on it. 
is what it seems like. There's there's so many versions of the story. Um, let's see here. Um. Yeah, if if you don't like me talking about Otani, okay. But I'm just saying a majority of this show is definitely talking about the Padres. And that's what it will be. If this was Otani playing another team, I probably wouldn't talk about it as much, but it was in the middle of a Padre Dodgers series. There was a San Diego connection as well in this in this story. I think Ipe and the dude that he was dealing with uh, met at a San Diego casino in like 2021. All right, no more Otani talk. Um, let's see here. The Baxman says, I like Profar over Fam in the outfield. Why? I mean, I'm not saying Fam's like the best defensive outfielder ever, but when you're talking about the entire package, it's not like Profar won't be on this team and they have to pick. Now, Fam would be starting, obviously. But like Profar, they signed him to be a utility guy. Azokar came in for defense late in this game for Jerkson. Like, there's a reason for that. It's, it's not like Profar, yes, he's made some good throws. It was fun to watch in 2022. But I think he's best for this team when he is a utility guy and can fill in and can play, not start every day. If you want to improve the offense, getting Tommy Pham improves the offense. Yeah, Fan Fest was canceled because of weather, in, incoming weather. Um, let's see here. Continuing to co to, to go through. The chat here. SD fan says extend Merrill or too soon. Yeah, a little too soon. You know, maybe I know Cronenworth was different. He's older, but let's learn our lesson there. Merrill sure seems like he's a huge part of our future, but it doesn't seem like the Padres are even in a position to commit that money to Merrill. He's in his first year. Let's maybe you do it in the offseason before you go to arbitration. But don't extend Jackson Merrill when he hasn't even played a game at Petco Park yet in a big league uniform. Don't do it when you don't have to do it. I think it's smart to do it maybe to avoid the arbitration years. Avoid that, right? And you can buy out free agent years and you don't have to pay till he's 40. But don't do it when he's in his arbitration years here. There's there's no need to do that. Ah, maybe this is gonna be a a certain thing brought up, probably. They canceled Fan Fest so that they could save money because there's gonna be a lot of money but involved because it costs a lot of money to to run something like that. Okay, but what you think they haven't spent money on the fan fest, like getting the things for fan fest? They haven't spent money on that. I mean, how much does running a fan fest cost? And is that budget in the baseball operations budget or is that budget in the business operations budget? Like Grubner, he said on the radio the other day, I forget where or else I would credit it, but um, the but I think it was Darren Smith. The budget of like Gallagher Square, that money, it's not like they took the baseball operations money that Preller has and put it in Gallagher Square and said, you can't, we're, we're prioritizing in Gallagher Square over the roster. It's different budgets. So that's that right there is where I'm like, yeah, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. When you're so close to FanFest, you've already planned everything out. They probably had already set up for what they're doing. And I'm sure that there's money spent on the event. You know, so no. Now, 
let's say that it, it rains on Sunday. That would ruin fan fe- Now it it would ruin like because the the team's supposed to hit on the field and there's the celebrity softball game. So yeah, it would ruin that. But don't the players? I mean, at Fan Fest last year, the players they just sat in the in the concourse at Petco and signed autographs, took pictures. Like they could still do that if fans wanted to stand in the rain for that, right? But do the players want to do that? No, I wouldn't think. In the rain, they just got back from Korea. They'd rather just, you know, chill out, rest before the two exhibition games, Monday, Tuesday, and then they get one off day before they start, you know, the the, the grind of a season. Yeah, and Gallagher Square not finished. I see Greg say that. Yeah, yeah, it's... For anyone that has seen, I think I posted... Yeah, I did. Um, Brett, who's been on the show, Padre fan, he has a view of Gallagher Square and it, it it looks better than it did a couple weeks ago, but there's still plenty of room to improve there and, and get that thing built up. So it was never going to be ready. It's not like they canceled Fan Fest because Gallagher Square is not ready. Um, although you'd have to manage flow more because Gallagher Square, I mean, that's where they did the Q&As and a lot of people hang out, obviously. So you're going to have to manage that. But it, it yeah, it was going to be delayed. It's not going to be ready on the 28th. We'll see when it is ready. I mean, some of the stuff that's being built up, it does look cool from what I've seen, but I want to see it in use and when it's fully built, what does that look like? How much room? Is there more room with this? Is it less room? Obviously, part of it is turf, so it, I'm not going to look down there from my seat um, you know, in 309 and in September and see that it's brown. So with that, that's that's a positive there. And it seems like the area behind the the park, right? They they changed the location of that little play ball field. So it looks like there's some cool adjustments with this. Uh but yeah it's disappointing because I think fans were looking forward to it. FanFest was supposed to be like, here's your first look at the new Gallagher Square that was supposed to be part of it. And obviously there's no FanFest at all anymore. The Sidler thing, even if it was raining, I think you still have to have it, right? You're not pushing that back. You're you're doing it. You're not going to do it during the year. You're not going to do it the day before opening day. You're going to do it on the weekend so as many people can go as possible. You're just going to do it. If it rains, it rains. You honor Peter Seidler. He deserves that. All right. Talking Friars episode 576. Over an hour of talk. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the show. Um, thank you so much for the time. I don't take it for granted. I really do appreciate it. Um, you can hit me up at Talking Friars, Twitter, Instagram, on social media. Um, if you have any questions, obviously, I try to get to the comments in YouTube as well. So thank you so much again. Uh, I appreciate all of you and see you later.